It's a jungle out there. Right? How does the rest of it go? You don't know it? Nobody knows this song? It's a jungle out there. Uh, disorder everywhere. There's poison in the air. You know it's in the water. Well, I do. It's amazing. You don't know this song. Adrian Monk? You've never heard of Adrian Monk. He's like the best sleuth that's ever been on TV. If you haven't watched him, you need to watch him. He is paranoid. But he's also a genius. And he is able to overcome the turmoil that's in his own heart in order to solve crimes. And it's really kind of funny to watch him because he, he has to carry his wipes everywhere that he goes. He can't actually touch anybody because of the germs that they may have on them. He also has uh, some obsessive compulsive disorders that cause him to keep things in perfect order. And uh, I think people like him because they see a little bit of themselves in him. Just a little bit. Just enough to make us laugh at somebody who's worse off than we are. Well, one thing Adrian does not have in his own heart is tranquility. In spite of his giftedness, in spite of his ability to, to help other people function, he himself is barely making it. And it is a jungle out there. I experienced it yesterday when I went out and bought a car for Ian. Well, not everybody is looking out for my best interest. They're looking out for their own. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but we should be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. Now the kinds of trouble that we might have are very varied. I talked about how people can cause us trouble. That happens when they try to take advantage of us. It happens when they're being mean. They might say some mean things to us, and they might do things that cause us to really be hurt. We also know about catastrophes that can happen. Um, some of these are man-made. Some of them are simply what I would put in quotes, acts of God. You have hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and wildfires. These kinds of things can happen to cause you trouble. But then also there's this inner turmoil that we can feel within our own hearts because there are parts of us, pockets of our lives, that uh, nobody else can see except God. And we're hiding them from other people. And until we let them see the light of day, they're just going to continue to fester. So that's the kind of jungle that we're experiencing. That's the kind of trouble that we have in our human experience. So what is Jesus talking about when he says that he gives us peace? You know, the word shalom is a broad verb word. It's, a, it, it, it's something that you do, but it's also a noun. It's something that you are. It's a state of being. It is an act of the will. It is a sense of well-being. It is a sense of uh, lack of conflict, a sense of tranquility. Um, and peace happens in all dimensions. And this is what Jesus is offering us. First of all, he's offering us inner peace. John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus says that he's giving peace that's not like the world's. So uh, that begs the question, what is the world's peace like? Well, the world's peace is not very effective. It's a peace that comes through strength. One person overpowers the other, and then we have peace. It is a peace that is made through diplomacy, where a detente occurs, and two enemies learn to tolerate one another, and they put a boundary in place, and they say, as long as you have, follow that agreement, I will too. But as soon as you stop following that agreement, all bets are off. That's the kind of peace that the world gives us. But Jesus is giving a different kind of peace. He's giving us an inner peace that happens. 
It's not through meditating on a mantra. It is not through uh, giving us everything that we ever wanted. It is, in fact, an inner peace from knowing that Jesus is with us. He is telling us to not be afraid. He is telling us not to be troubled. But he also gives us a peace with God. He reconciles us to himself. In Romans 5, 1, we are told, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God actually reconciles us to himself through the cross of Christ. Jesus took on the penalty for our sin. Therefore, there is no longer any debt between us and him. And the question now, the equation, is no longer how much sin have we done, but what have we done with Jesus? And if we have, in fact, received Jesus into our lives, and we now call him our Lord and our Savior, then we do have peace with God. The problem that we have mostly in the world is our relationship with other people. Jesus actually disrupts the peace that the world gives. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What Jesus is talking about is not saying that he's calling his disciples to rise up with swords and kill people. That's, that's somebody else's God. No, Jesus is telling us that he has come to bring peace. But because people reject him, they are offended by him, they will also be offended by his disciples. And even within our own families, we experience people who reject our Lord. And when they do, in a way, we have a sword and not peace. We have fighting that goes on. We have real discord because we have real differences in values. One person is living for self and the other is living for God. Those two don't work too well together. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There is a peace that does happen between individuals, but it happens when those individuals are completely committed to God. If Jesus is your Lord and he is my Lord, we should be able to work and live in peace. That is how Jesus overcomes the world. Jesus' presence is, in fact, our peace. If you look at the passage that I read to you in John 20 just now, it says a couple of verses ahead of time, Then the same day at evening, this is Easter Sunday, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. The first words out of Jesus' mouth, seeing his disciples, according to the Gospel of John, is peace be with you. By him being with us, by him being risen from the dead, by him uh, having dominion in our lives, he gives us peace. We continue in John 20, the very next verse, he says, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So, peace is not just found in Jesus' presence, it's found in his commissioning. He has given us a purpose in life. And how did God send Jesus? Well, he was sent as a servant. If you look at Philippians 2, 5, and 7, we are told, Let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So, 
That is how Jesus is sending you. He's sending you to be a servant. He's sending you to have an attitude of humility. Even though you are a child of God, you shouldn't be lording it over other people because of your position. Instead, you should be serving other people. And you should take on the form of a slave. That's what Jesus is commissioning us to do. The good news is, he doesn't just tell you to do something and then not give you any way of doing it. Sometimes the government will do that. We saw that most recently when uh, the federal government wanted to get information about the voting that occurred to make sure that there were no uh, double dipping going on. Well, they didn't fund it. There was no power behind it. And if the states were going to comply, they had to do it themselves. Well, that's not how it works with God. If he's going to ask you to do something, he's going to give you the power to do it. John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You, by faith in Jesus Christ, have the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit gives you power to do the things that he has commissioned you to do. Zechariah 4, 6 says, so he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord, which is Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You know, I think there are times when we try to do things on our own, and it fails. It really does. But if you pray about it and ask God for help and wisdom, he gives it. But then when he answers your prayer, you want to be able to turn around and give him glory and let other people know that God answers prayer. He answered your prayer, and he met your need, and enabled you to do something for his glory. So what is this that we are called to do? Well, we are called to a ministry of reconciliation. That's a long word. Reconciliation comes from reconcile, rec, re, again, con, with, and the ciliation, to come together, to be united one more time. So where we have a broken relationship with God and with other people, we are now called to a ministry of renewing and restoring those relationships. John 20, 23, Jesus says, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, the Apostle says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's hard to forgive people sometimes. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. If we are able to forgive, they are, in fact, forgiven. In terms of the relationship with God, we can bring people to water, but we can't make them drink, can we? You can let them know how they can have a renewed relationship with God, but it's not our responsibility to convert. It's our responsibility to be God's ambassador, encouraging people to turn around. So that really is the recipe of peace. To know God's presence, to know God's purpose, to grab a hold of God's power, and then to offer that reconciliation, to then send out God's message. So, I wanted to ask you today, how's your peace today? What does your peace so meter look like? Are you sitting that things are excellent? God's walking with you on a regular basis, he's here right now. Even though there's trouble all around you, you're just having that inner tranquility and nothing can penetrate it. Or are you in a frenzy? Are you completely focused on your problems instead of on God himself? Well, I'd like to help you out of that if you are redlining. I think the first step to finding peace is knowing 
our identity. Knowing who we are in Jesus Christ. And I could have given you like 50 different verses to tell you who you are in Jesus Christ. And I may have done that in the past. Today I'm only going to give you two. Alright? You are God's child. How many of you either are or have children? Do you have a parent? Raise your hand. If you have a parent, and the parent was worth anything at all in this world, you know what it's like to have a relationship with that parent. For some of you, it may have been broken, filled with alcohol or gambling or uh, infidelity. That's not what God's like. God's perfect. He's holy, and he's filled with love. And you are actually his child. He adopted you. And that means that you have all of the rights and responsibilities tied to that. John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Do you believe in Jesus? If you do, you're his child. Psalm 118 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? It's a rhetorical question. What can man do to you if God's on your side? The answer is nothing. Even Satan himself is merely a tool in God's hand. So we know our identity. We also need to practice God's presence. Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I've heard of that saying, to be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. That's a bunch of nonsense. C.S. Lewis put it this way, if you seek after happiness, you will miss it every time. But if you seek after God, you will not only receive him, but you're going to receive all of the joy that the world could offer. Because the world without God is completely empty. If you are so heavenly minded, as you might say you are, then you will be focused on the needs of other people. You will understand how you can serve them. You will want to go out and do those things. You might even want to clean a toilet out in the woods or whatever. Those are things that we can do if God is with us, if we are spiritually minded. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an amazing gift, and I have talked about him in the past. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He's the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and he's alive in you. He's the one that can transform your heart and your mind, so that you begin to think and act more like Jesus. And he is the one that can empower you to actually do work that you could never do on your own. Those are called gifts. He can give you gifts to help strengthen the church and to help reach out to people that do not yet know him. And that God of hope is able to fill you with joy. You also need to follow his lead. It's not enough to have the Holy Spirit within you if you're going to continue to rebel against him. If you're going to squash his leading. No. He wants to guide you. In Romans 8, 14 it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons or children of God. So if you're being led by the Spirit, you're our child. See the corollary in John 1, 12? If you believe in Jesus... You are God's child. In geometry, they would call that a syllogism. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if you believe in Jesus, then you are being led by the Spirit. One leads to the other. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
And then finally, if you really want to experience peace, you will be obeying God by being his ambassador, by sharing the good news with others. If you're holding that within you, there's no peace there. Because the Holy Spirit is a river of life flowing through you. And it flows through your mouth as you share Jesus Christ. If you aren't sharing Jesus Christ, then you've dammed the river. And it's starting to overflow. And it's building pressure. And eventually, it could uh, do a couple of things. But eventually, you'll have no choice but to share Christ. But the other possibility is that the Spirit of God will simply stop flowing through you. You'll have quenched him. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So you are ambassadors, just like I am. A few weeks ago, I talked about a gospel challenge. I'm not sure if you were here for that or if you remember it or not. But in the back, on the back table, are some four spiritual laws. If you do not feel confident in sharing your faith, take one and read it. Read it through. Look up all of the scriptures that are tied to it in context. So get out your Bible and look them up. You're going to become familiar with the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you have familiarized yourself with that whole book, share it with somebody. Ask God to put somebody on your heart that you can pray for that they would come to believe in Jesus Christ. And then ask God to give you opportunity and boldness to share your faith with them. If you really want to experience peace with God and with other people and within yourself, you need to be able to do these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we do not always experience this inner tranquility and this peace with other people. And, and this is evidence that our peace with you is even broken. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to identify where we might be missing the process, whether we are not experiencing your presence or whether we have not really submitted to your lordship. Um, maybe we're not being led by your spirit or maybe we're simply not sharing our faith. Lord, you said in the midst of this world we would have trouble. And so we don't expect our troubles to disappear. However, Lord, you promised that you would give us peace. And if we're not experiencing it, Lord, help us to troubleshoot it so that we can have peace. We pray in Jesus' name.